people don't tend to hire based on the belief that you can do a job. We need to prove that you can do the job. So it's usually easier to find that opportunity and within the organization that you're already working with. But yeah, I guess it's just trying to find that opportunity. It's not in your team, within the business, but in a different team. So don't be afraid of moving horizontally because that can bring benefits. It's also going to actually give you exposure to other parts of the business that it's going to give you more knowledge, become well-rounded across the, the business and that's something that it's very valued uh, and uh, when you go and to hire more in more senior roles, I would say. Hi everyone, this is Covid back with another episode of Grow CTO podcast and today with us we have our special guest Carlos. He is head of engineering at Vitality having more than 15 plus years of engineering and leadership experience. Welcome to the show, Carlos. Happy to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be here and uh, share my experience with you today. Of course, we are looking forward to a lot of learning. And before we get started on our today's topic, which is the not so easy transition from an IC to an EM role, uh, we would love to know a little bit more about you. Uh, I, I, I had a very brief intro here. But I would love to know more about you, uh, your hobbies, uh, your childhood, your teenage, and how you transitioned into who you are today. So over to you. Uh, tell us about yourself, something that probably social media doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of that. But um, so first of all, actually, I'm, I'm Portuguese. I um, moved to the UK about eight years ago. Um, it was a... An interesting transition, a new culture, new way of living, but very happy with, with that move um, so far, at least. Uh, in terms of how I got to this, um, what I got to today, I guess it was mainly influenced by one of my cousins. Uh, I saw him as a little bit of a mentor when I was a teenager. He was very much keen to computers and computer science and programming. And I was like, oh, that looks interesting. So uh, is this something that I will actually enjoy doing? I remember that I was a little bit on the fence between uh, following a computer science degree or <clears throat> going into um, physical education at the time, so being a PE teacher. But uh, yeah, in the end, <laughs> computer science won. Um, and I never looked back. And it's been so far a very rewarding journey, if I may say so. And something personal that no one, well, my friends know about it, uh, but social media doesn't know, is that I'm a very avid salsa dancer. Uh, oh, so nice. My, yeah, <laughs> sort of my, my hobbies outside of work. Well, you have a partner with you? Uh, well, usually when, whenever you go to these social events, you tend to find multiple partners there. But yeah, sometimes I do go with uh, with friends and uh, not necessarily a, a, a set partner. So you get to swap uh, well, partners okay. during, during the event. And it's a lot of fun. It's a good way to actually interact and socialize with people. I do recommend for anyone that I haven't tried before. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I think that was really interesting. But you mentioned about... Uh, it was between physical education and uh, computer science, right? So like yeah. from the childhood, teenage, like you had any sport that you were really interested in, you were playing something or uh, it was just uh, out of curiosity or you liked physical education in general? No, I was very active as a kid. Uh, so when I was uh, six, seven, my, my parents put me into swimming, swam until I was 15, did some competition, then transitioned to... Uh, athletics. I did athletics from the age of 12 until I was 18. Again, did competition and I really did enjoy the, the competition side of it. Again, the training with colleagues and um, that was also a lot of fun. And because I did enjoy that, like that, that part and it made me feel really, really well about myself. So I did think that hmm, maybe it's something that I actually want to do full time. But mm -hmm. then... Uh, looking at all the options and all the alternatives, I guess that computer science just won in the end. Uh, I can, I'm still very physically active. I did try to hit the gym, uh, multiple times a week. I'm not saying that I'm hundred percent successful at that, but I do try yeah. my best. 
but um, yeah, I still like to keep myself like fit and, and healthy as much as possible. No, I think that's that's really great. I think mean, uh, childhood, uh, then when you are uh, as a kid involved in sports and uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've seen a lot of my, my peers also who have been there uh, late state level, national level competitions ultimately in their careers, professionally also, came out to be very good leaders in general somehow. And I am sure there is some linkage to that where you are more motivated, you are more uh, like a fighter spirit is there basically. So I think maybe yeah. that really impacts uh, on on overall uh, journey as professionally also if you see. So yeah, cool. I think that's, that's really interesting. So I think uh, from there, moving into present as a head of engineering for Vitality, right? And then tell us something yeah, about the uh, company, what's your role here, what do you do as a head of engineering, what kind of responsibilities you have. And uh, of course, you would love to know when you transitioned from the point where you were into engineering and then moving into, uh, you were at an IC and you were moving into a management role. How did that transition happen? Sure. So currently, as you said, I'm head of engineering for Vitality. Uh, for those that don't know, Vitality is an insurance company <laughs> that operates within the uh, health and live space. Uh, I'm responsible for the systems that support our members in their both health and life claims journey. Uh, there's a big focus right now for us in terms of increasing our digital capabilities to allow the members to service themselves mostly digitally. Of course, there's going to be the need to uh, sometimes reach into like, email or call, uh, but trying to minimize that as much as possible. Um, there's also been a lot of focus in terms of uh, after you get uh, treatment or consultation to allow you to allow you the member to uh, continue that uh, continuous care like online, as I said as much as possible. Uh, there's a lot of modernization in terms of our systems that comes as part of the data gen- and engineering role. A lot of engagement with a lot of other departments like the product departments, um, eventually sales. Um, it's, I think it's one of the things I really enjoy the most as part of my role is that I tend to talk to a lot of different people that do a lot of different things. Uh, there's a lot of forward looking in terms of what we want to do in the future. What's the plan for the next two, three years? Where do we want to take our products? Um, and this is something that we'll get into more detail after, but it's one of the big differences that I've, that I've seen in the role that you have as an IC versus uh, an EM or a head of specifically where the division that you have, it's more shorter term as an IC versus a medium to long uh, term vision for someone that operates at, our, at, at this level, to be more specific. Yeah, of course, yes. um, specifically about my, my transition. So let me think. This was a while back. Uh, so uh, before, as a individual contributor, uh, so I started with Microsoft Technologies doing C Sharp, uh, messing with uh, SQL databases, uh, mainly full stack at the time, which was actually a very good learning opportunity because you do get the opportunity to uh, learn how the how an application works full stack. You mess a little yeah. bit with the back end, a little bit with the front end, a little bit with the uh, your data store, and that allows you to understand the effort that goes into each of the different components to have uh, an application uh, up and running. And this was still in the times where monoliths were the, the trend, not uh, as it is today, where everything is, well, microservices, not everything, but it, it seems that that's the, the trend right now, even if I've seen that yeah. some uh, corporations are, are debating the going back to monoliths, which is uh, something I would say. <laughs> That's that's a, that would be a completely different podcast, and uh, we'll, we would spend enough time just discussing that. But that's yeah, that's a different conversation. But in terms of transitioning to um, an EM or a people uh, team leader, to be more specific, it happened where my manager at the time actually had to leave the business for personal reasons, and I was invited to uh, replace him. Um, it was. A surprise, a good surprise, because something that I really, really wanted to do, but still a surprise. It was uh, interesting because when I transitioned, I was told that I could choose the some of the team members that I would like to work with. What, in my opinion, actually helped quite a lot because 
having people that you can trust uh, with you, people that you actually have worked with before also does, does help in that transition. But I did feel at the time that I did have a little bit of uh, an imposter syndrome and said, well, why am I doing this? And why isn't uh, someone else doing this? Or why was I invited when there's people that have been here maybe for longer than I have uh, and are as good or even better than I am. But then after going through that process, I said, well, if they chose me, there must be a reason why. So let's trust the process. And then I try to use that to build my confidence um, because it is, it, is, it is a shift. It is a change. And it is something that um, we need to start thinking differently. So, for example, when I was working as a software engineer, it was very much focused on my tasks. What do I need to do today? Uh, I, I did have to interact with colleagues and understand what they were doing, but it was very much um, not siloed, but focused on, on what I had to do. Whilst when I went to this transition, it became... Okay, what does my team need to do? What do they need to uh, to perform their tasks? How can I help them? How can I support them to achieve their goals, their objectives, our common goals, our common objectives? And that was one of the the shifts, and one of the changes yeah. that I that I had to face. Uh, the fact that you are no longer as close to the detail as before was something that I actually struggled quite a lot uh, in the beginning. And I, I remember a, a situation where... Yeah. I think for you, um, it happened coincidentally that the manager left and you got the opportunity to move into this mm -hmm. role. Um, yeah. Uh, I think uh, now when you are here into this journey for maybe more than a few years, uh, let's say if there is someone... Uh, who is actually at the point where they can consciously make a choice of transitioning uh, into a technical role than a management role or a mm -hmm. management role than a technical role. Uh, what do you think are the core uh, beliefs that that person should have uh, to be doing great uh, in this management side of uh, the technical vertical, I would say. And what all it takes the change, I think you have already highlighted a few points that the change, mm -hmm. changes are really, really drastic because initially you are just not siloed exactly, but you are working on specific things that are bound to be with you. And the impact is like here in front of you and you, you do things and you see changes. So the changes are there, but at the core, I think when you're making a conscious choice, you need to know who you are, right? And what it's like, you should identify themselves to do good in this journey. Um, the first thing that I would say is how much do you love being a technical minded person? Okay. To me, that's the, the, the fundamental thing. Um, if you love, so talking about engineering specifically, if you love coding, if you love being part of the technical discussions, if you, if it's something that you know that you're going to miss, maybe being an engineering manager or uh, a team leader is not for you. Because mm. the higher up you go, the less opportunity you're gonna have to to do that. Uh, there are some some exceptions, of course, where there are some um, head of engineering roles or even uh, CTO roles that are hands on. But that's in my in my experience, that's the exception. So if you do really enjoy um, that aspect of the of the job, so being tackle, being hands on, maybe. Moving into that uh, engineering manager role is not necessarily for you. Also, how much do you enjoy managing people? And this is also something that is very, very important because you are no longer focusing just on on you, on yourself as, a, as an individual. You are supposed to uh, nurture, guide, mentor, find opportunity for the people that uh, you are responsible for to, uh, to grow. If you don't like that aspect of the, the job, then again, maybe it's not for you. Uh, so, but if you do, and if you do enjoy talking to other people, if you do enjoy learning more about the the wider aspect of the of the business that you're trying to uh, to support and you work for, if you if you do enjoy um, guiding, 
showing, giving people direction, tell them, uh, show them how their day-to-day -day work is influencing positively the, the goals of the company, then yes, by all means, go for it. Um, be intentional about it. Try to find within your, your team opportunities to take some of the tasks that your current team leader does. So one of the things that I always tried to do uh, was to identify within my teams if there were people that actually wanted to take in that step uh, in the near future and try to expose them to some of the activities that were like that were my responsibility. So I'll delegate to them, uh, let's say, uh, talking to uh, architects or talking to uh, some of the, the people from, from, from the product uh, teams. And by doing that, you can actually assess, okay, do I enjoy doing this? Or is it something that I actually had in my mind, but it's not something that I actually do uh, see myself doing every single day? Because that's the thing. Uh, doing it every single day, it's different from doing it every now and then. Yeah. Yes. The good thing is you can also try it for a while. And if it doesn't work out, you can always revert back to the, 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 the role that you had before. And I think that's the one of the things that people sometimes need to consider is that a choice that you make today is not necessarily a choice for life. Yeah, I think that's a very good advice. And I feel uh, if someone wants to even try that, uh, one can actually get the taste of it at a technical leader role, right? A team lead role, basically, where you mm -hmm. are involved technically. And I have seen most of the mm -hmm. team leaders, tech leaders are coding also. And at the same time, supporting their teams in every possible way. So I think for anyone who wants to see how things would look like, can get a taste of it as soon as they step into a, a team lead kind of a role. But the, the thing is like, uh, most of the people uh, are driven by two primary reasons to make those career moves. One is, of course, uh, what you like to do, what aligns with your character, your identity, your personality. And the second is, of course, uh, how it is going to progress financially also, right? That that mm -hmm. also becomes a concern for people. So in, in your opinion, how do you think uh, in, in a futuristic way, uh, things can impact someone financially if they're taking the technical route or uh, a management route in, in any company for say. Maybe you can't generalize it, but I, I am asking the general question. You can, of course, answer it uh, the way you feel about this. Well, I guess it all depends where you want to get to. Okay, so um, when you get to that um, senior software engineer, principal mm -hmm. software engineer role or principal test engineer role, so where you are considered to be a specialist, that people can look for with any guidance, right? Someone that's going to help shape uh, technical decisions, someone that's going to help define the best technical standards for software engineering and test engineering. Um, from there, eventually the path can become of, of being an architect, solutions architect, enterprise architect, uh, chief enterprise architect. So I think there are ways to progress where you can actually keep being um, very close to what you enjoy and also seeing that financial benefit. But if you uh, would rather be a people, ma people manager, where you go through the engineer manager, head of CTO uh, role, then again, there are, there's different, there are different parts, but you can still get the benefits, the financial benefits that you were talking about. It's just making sure that at the end of the day that you still enjoy what you're doing. Um, in my case, one of the things that actually made me, uh, make this shift wasn't necessarily, well, of course the financial, the financial gains are important, but it was actually the fact that I enjoy working with people and enjoy working as part of a team and try to expand my, uh, my remit in terms of, uh, wealth interacting with day to day. Um, I like to understand or get a better understanding of what I'm doing, how it's impacting a wider business. And I think that's where this uh, want, want came from. And it wasn't necessarily just the financial benefit. But just going back to what I was saying, try to understand uh, which part makes more sense to you. But I wouldn't say necessarily that one would uh, be uh, detrimental in terms of the financial benefit or not. And there's been, there's plenty of situations where even software engineers 
are quite well paid if the skills that they have are quite uncommon in the market. So if that's the case, if you are a specialist in an area that there's not a lot of offer, then you also get that, that benefit of being uh, well financially rewarded and still doing what you love. Makes sense. So let's let's talk about uh, the point where let's say I have taken the decision to move from an IC to a management role. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, what should I start doing today? Let's say today I'm a senior software engineer, or let's say I'm a I'm a tech lead. What should I start doing to get to the next step? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, impact should I be uh, reflecting on the team, on the things that I'm doing? so that the managers, the leaders of the teams are feeling that, okay, I am the right person to be pulled up to this particular uh, profile. So it happened for you coincidentally, but I'm sure in retrospect, yeah. you can tell what they saw in you and how, how it turned out. So what do you think uh, one should start doing today? So I, I think the first thing is look at the people that uh, you report into and let them know that that's something that you do want to do. The first thing, that, that should be the first, the first step. Second is if you feel that the person that you report into is not giving the opportunities to um, get exposed to some of the activities that would normally be given to, to them, then again, ask them, is it okay if next time I do this presentation? Is it okay if next time I get the data for this report? Uh, for example, one of the things that an engineer has to do is to look at their team metrics. Uh, to understand yeah. how, how they're progressing, if things are going according to plan. Okay. Is that something that I, I can do on my own? Even if my engineer manager or my, my team lead is actually doing it, I have access to the information so I can actually go and have a look and understand how is my team performing? If there's something that is not necessarily right, how, what can I do to, um, to change things? I guess all this summarizes into being intentional. Identify the areas where you, you know that your team lead needs to operate in and try to go in, have a look at what you need to do. Um, but it, again, it all comes on to being supported by, by that person that, it's, uh, that you're reporting to, so your, your line manager. Uh, if that's not really an option, then sometimes you need to look for that opportunity elsewhere. Yeah. Even though it's more difficult, because people don't tend to hire based on the belief that you can do a job. We need to prove that you can do the, the, the job itself. So it's usually easier to find that opportunity um, within the organization that you're already working with. But yeah, I guess it's just trying to find that opportunity. It's not in your team within the business, but in a different team. Don't be afraid of moving horizontally because that can bring benefits. It's also going to actually give you exposure to other parts of the business that uh, it's going to give you more knowledge, become well-rounded across the, the business. And that's something that it's very valued uh, and, uh, when you go into higher, more in more senior roles, I would say. Makes sense. I think um, this is one uh, very good way, like going out and explicitly mentioning uh, it to your manager that you want to move into that role. Of course, that really, really helps in terms of highlighting, okay, for the manager also, it becomes easier to align mm -hmm. people, to make sure that they stick, because their role is to keep people happy, right? And when they know what they are yeah. wanting, it's much easier for them to deliver that. But let's say there are situations where the opportunity is not being given by the manager. What else can someone do on their own? What they can do in their day-to-day -day routine uh, to actually reflect those traits and maybe the manager themselves come asking for it, or maybe if, let's say mm -hmm. he are working with a cross-functional team, the other people appreciate that trait of yours uh, and they start looking at you from that point of view that, oh yeah, this person could be uh, moved into a management role or a lead role and uh, moving forward. So what, what what are those kind of things that probably a senior software engineer or a tech lead should start doing from today on them? Uh, so one of the things that you mentioned that it's very, very important is being uh, someone that it's good technically, that the team can rely on and support for guidance, but it's also trying to be a leader and the neutral leader. It can make sense. So we're, we're talking about that. Someone that uh, your team can go to 
and trust if they feel that they need some some support. It's someone that people from outside your team can go to if they have any questions. You need to be seen as someone that knows what they're doing, that understands uh, the the benefit that the team brings, that understands other parts of the business, someone that um, is seen as an expert in, in their field. I think that would be the first thing. Uh, but it's also putting yourself out there. And well, what I said before in terms of putting yourself out there and telling telling your manager that you have this this want and this objective, but talk to other people about it. One one thing that actually I did indirectly that I think also helped when people thought about me uh, at the time was looking for guidance and mentors outside of my most immediate circle. Because when you do that, the people they do realize that you do want you doing more, that you're ambitious, that you're trying to uh, get outside of what you do now and you want to step into a more senior role. And not only that, people get to know you. And that's one very important thing that is, if people don't know you, they're not going to think about you uh, when the opportunity comes because there's going to be someone else they're going to think of first. So put yourself out there. Makes sense. Totally makes sense. So moving on from uh, one should be doing at this point of time when they're wanting to be there, uh, mm -hmm. Next step is like forcing the challenges that are coming on the way. I, I, you briefly talked about it, or <laughs> but I think uh, I want to deep dive into what are those experiences. Like, if you could just give me some examples that as soon as you moved into that role, what were the first experience which made you realize where am I? What should I be doing now? <laughs> well, something of that sort. So that people who are really looking up to that to know okay what's on their way now. Well, I guess it depends on the team that you're going to be looking after. But one thing that, well, two things actually that I think might might happen uh, in a way that kind of happened to me. Uh, one is trust yourself. Otherwise, that imposter syndrome that I mentioned before, it might consume you. And then you're going to be so focused in trying to prove to others that you can actually do it, that you're going to forget how you should actually be focusing on the job itself. Um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more on that. So there's two things that you actually, uh, that I faced actually. One was the, that imposter syndrome that, uh, at the beginning kind of affected my, my confidence. And I got so concerned about what others were thinking that I forgot about doing the, the the job itself. I was so concerned about, but what if they think that I'm not good enough? What if they uh, think that I'm not the best person for the job? Don't, don't, don't fall into that trap. As I said before, if you're appointed to do something, trust that you're the right person for the job, focus on your skills, focus on the benefits that you believe that you can bring to the team because we're all different. The different people will manage, manage differently. There's not necessarily one uh, size fits all when it comes to, to management. Okay. And then I guess the other thing is the the fact that some people will again try and question. So, so it's the same thing, but in but coming from others actually, you get see you experience people coming to you and not necessarily asking why are you my manager now when two weeks ago we were peers. Yeah. But there are some things that you can pick up where actually you can sense that people are almost trying to test you and don't fall into the trap again of trying to convince them that you're the right person for the job. So focus on what you think the job is. Look upwards for guidance. Look, not necessarily your line manager, but other people that are... Uh, that you tend to work with, as long as they have they have more experience than you, it might be another team lead or another engineer manager that has done has done it for a lot longer than you, and you can look at them for guidance and say, "Well, I'm doing this. Do you think this is something that it's working, or do you have any advice for me to do something uh, still slightly differently?" So try to use that as a as a sounding board, but don't fall into the trap of trying to convince others that you're the right person for the job. 
So focus on you. And uh, just to add to it, I think uh, I have a few friends who have moved into this role and they're mm -hmm. mostly uh, being troubled uh, with the fact that now they're not actually doing something related to engineering. They're mostly managing <laughs> people, right? And yeah. He also mentioned in the beginning that it becomes more about that. And uh, of course, it doesn't come uh, very naturally to a lot of people uh, who have been into the tech space for, let's say, good five to eight to 10 years, and mm -hmm. then uh, they're moving into this room. So now in that situation, I think, uh, what what would be that right piece of advice for people to change that core belief system? Because it, it you become like that, right? You, you yeah. tend to be more, I wouldn't say introvert. Introvert could be a long word here, but <laughs> something of that sort where... Uh, right communication, uh, handling things proactively so that they don't end up messed up, end up getting messed up. So things like that happen. And and I think the core thing lies within the frame of having the right communication style, right communication. So how, how one should learn to do that? Because that's very evident that one needs to do that. How, how should one be doing that in that room? Just, just two things on that. That is in terms of letting go, I think the best thing that you can do is actually just delegate. And by delegating, I don't mean delegating your new tasks into your team. Delegate the tasks that you believe they still that you should still be doing to your team. Because in the first few months, what's going to happen is your mindset is going to be, oh, I need to go and look at the code. I need to go and check that that pull request to make sure that it's yeah. following the standards. No, I'm not saying let it go completely. But if you know the people that you're working with, you know that you can trust them, just delegate it to them. Don't try not to think about it. Again, tell them that if there's anything that is wrong, if there's a problem, come to me. Leave that to the side and focus on what does my team need? How are they performing? What does my team require to perform this task? Are they blocked by something? Are they... Is there something that I can do differently that would benefit them? I think that's when things start to uh, settle down from from that shift from uh, an engineering manager when you start thinking about the team first. Got it. And in terms of communication, one of the things that I do even today is talk to everyone individually. Of course, make time to talk to your team individually. Try to understand what their motivations are. Try to understand what drives them. Try to understand how things are going, even outside of work, because we're we don't we're not just employees. We have a life outside of work. Yeah, that is more important. I would say, at least for me, it's more important than going into the office nine to five, and then that's 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 all of your lives. So, and that has a big influence of how you perform at work. So. If there's anything that it's happening, try to be available if they want to talk to you. Um, and finding that space where people start to trust you and they they come to you for problems, they come to you for good things. And that that's when you actually, the communication is flowing. The communication is good between us. They trust me. They, they feel like I'm here to help them. They feel like I'm here to guide them and do what's best for them. And, and what it takes, it takes a lot of time to get to that point. But <clears throat> the main thing is stop thinking about what you can do, how, uh, how your own individual work is going to impact you, but try to think more about this is what my team needs. This is what the group of people that I'm responsible for can thrive and can succeed because your success comes from their success. Cool. I think uh, the last line you said is the most impactful one for this role, probably. Like, their success is my success. And that, that's how yeah. one should be progressing. And that's the mindset one would need when they're moving from the role, from the IC role to an EM kind of role. So, cool, Carlos. I think uh, there is a lot more to talk about this topic. <laughs> I am I know, sorry for we not cover it in one one session that we're having with you. Would love to have you for another session. Maybe seeing how you progress from an EM role to a end of engineering role. That could be another discussion totally. And uh, 
happy to have you again uh, anytime whenever you 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 think you have time to discuss about it <laughs> and uh, talking about the mentoring piece uh, just for our audience to uh, let them know uh, grow cto has come up with the, a grow cto connect uh, initiative where we are helping these ens ics technical leaders connect with leadership people for their mentorship to grow to the next level so it's grow cto connect uh, would be happy if people want to send in requests i i share the uh, link of our grow cto connect page uh, in the comments and with that alas thank you so much for your time uh, loved having you here really insightful talk uh, see you soon and thank you very much for the opportunity again it was a pleasure and reach out i'll be always available thank you thank you so much alas